said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey, to, in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. To quote Dr. King, although this parable is concerned with the power of persistent prayer, it may also serve as a basis for our thought concerning many contemporary problems. It is midnight in the parable, and it is midnight in our world. And the darkness is so deep that we can hardly tell where to turn. As in the parable, so in our world today, the deep darkness of midnight is interrupted by the sound of a knock. The traveler asks for three loaves of bread. The traveler, in this case, is a Negro. Is it midnight when the median household wealth for white families is $91,000 versus African-American households being $6,000? West Georgia, Carrollton, what will we do when there's a knock at midnight? Many of us don't even open our doors at noon, much less midnight. And so I'm not talking about literally. I'm talking about in the real sense our responsibility is to open the door and give those knocking the bread of hope. For when hope dies, so does the will of the Spirit. We must lay a foundation for those who come after us and illustrate what it means to be in a concomitant relationship with each other, connected through a vast universe of humanity. We must be like the old man in the poem by William Drumgoole, which read, an old man going a long highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast, deep and wide, through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fear for him. But he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man said, a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again will pass this way. You cross the chasm deep and wide. Why build you this bridge, the evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head Good friend, in the path I've come, he said, there follows after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that has been naught to me, to that fair-haired youth, may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. What we must do is not just sit here and listen. We have to take the message and disperse and act. We must remember not to allow ourselves to be submitted to the comfort of the suburbs, to be submitted to the halls of academia, to be submitted to all the pleasures of life when others are starved away by the discomfort of unfair wages and priced out tuition for these same halls. If we're going to live like Dr. King and not just talk like him, then we must believe in the spirit of self-sacrifice. We must believe in doing something above oneself. When Dr. King talked about a knock at midnight, he used the metaphor of darkness to describe the collective situation of America at war and America at war with itself. He's saying that it's midnight in America. What will we do when the knock comes? When the man in the parable knocked on his friend's door and asked for three loaves of bread, he received the impatient retort, do not bother me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. The weary traveler by midnight who asked for bread is really seeking the dawn. Our eternal message of hope has to be that dawn will come. And so even in 2016, whether you're in West Georgia or you're in Central Alabama, many are wondering, if that dawn will actually come. Some of you may know, even as we bask in the almost complete second term of the first black president, Barack Obama, when one overlooks the narrative of the day, you have to wonder, is it still night? If we're here to examine Dr. King through the complex lens that he so richly deserves, ask yourself, is it midnight when black unemployment staggers around 11.4% which is more than twice that of our white brothers and sisters? Is it midnight when youth unemployment is 20.7% for African Americans and youth unemployment for white youth is 10%? Is it midnight when the black college 
graduation rates, not HBCU, when black or African American college graduation rates lag behind and black men only graduate college at 33%. Now this is not to bring shame on anyone, it is to highlight some of the factors and some of the things that we're doing here. Only through a room such as this can you begin to change it because you have to know that it exists. It's not to point fingers. It is for a time of reflection. It is for a time of thought. And so we have to keep in mind that if we're going to do the things Dr. King did, we have to make sure that our works are emphasized in humanity's table of contents, not in the index where they're only mentioned. We must stand for all of our brothers and sisters of humanity, those who may not look like us, those who may not pray like us, those who may not love like us. That's the poor white, that's the undocumented brown, that is the LGBT African American. And let me be clear, I'm not just espousing this to you, I'm espousing this to myself as well. Because I had a moment where I had to make a decision whether or not I was gonna just talk like Dr. King in my speeches, or if I was going to live like Dr. King. And that came with a judicial order given by our Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in the state of Alabama to deny people what a federal court had already ruled, and that was the right to marry a person of the same sex. And regardless of what you think about that ideal, we are a nation of laws, not of men. And for me, it harkened back to the time that we're talking about. And that's a time when you had leaders who dwelled in the politics of defiance of the federal government. So I had to make a decision. What did I do? Somebody asked me on Twitter, well, are you going to follow the federal court order or are you going to listen to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Well, my history tells me that federal law trumps state law. My history tells me that there were those who did not want to allow black people to register to vote when federal court orders did that. Now, would I participate in the same type of hypocrisy and the same type of thing that many before me did? No, I wouldn't. And so I tweeted back, we will marry anybody who wants to be married, regardless of who they want to be married to. Little did I know with that tweet that the New York Times and This Week, with George Stephanopoulos and the Washington Post and German television and everyone else would come and want to talk to me about this open act of defiance. But it really wasn't an act of defiance. It really wasn't an act of courage. It really was just doing what was right. And so I say to you that as we take a look at Dr. King's life, as we take a look at his legacy, the last piece that we have to keep in mind, that is the other America. Dr. King spoke about this at Stanford, and I won't get too far into it because I don't want to put you to sleep, not because of the speech, but because I'm keeping you too long. But what I want, to keep, you know, I want you to keep in mind is this. When we're talking about the other America, this isn't a new argument. It's not a new discussion. It's not a new debate. Dr. King, when he addressed Stanford in 1967, so eloquently addressed the rise in income inequality. That may be something that you all heard about very recently. It's something that's talked about all the time. But this Dr. King had more than a dream. He had an action plan. And he spoke about needing a radical change in economic power. And while he called the riots socially destructive and self-defeating, he also condemned those who created the conditions that caused the riots. And so he talked about those very people, very similar to the way people talk about the Black Lives Movement, the Black Lives Matter. These protests have been by and large peaceful and without any incident. But there have been those who want to equate them with violence. And what Dr. King said, riots are the language of the unheard. Summer's riots are caused by the nation's winters of delay. And so again, if we're gonna follow in the echoes of Dr. King, if we're gonna do more than just have a program of singing and speaking, if we're going to do more, then we've got to do more. You've gotta do more, I've gotta do more. We've gotta do more together. We've got to get rid of the notion that time will heal all racial inequality, because it won't. Time is neutral, but what we do with it is up to us. How we use it is under our control. You know, 
folks at Morehouse used to call Dr. King Tweed. And again, learning from some of his classmates before many of them passed away, we didn't know what, why they called him Tweed. They said, well, you know, Michael always came around here in Tweed. And so that's kind of the name he got. Now, I don't know how many of you all have Tweed suits or Tweed coats, but you know Tweed and you know it's kind of hot. Well, that name just kind of stuck with him. Well, Tweed once said, we may have to repent for the vitriolic words and actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence and inaction of the good people will also have to be repented for as well. Social progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. 